Good evening and welcome to this service for Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. I'm Robert Cotton, the Rector of Holy Trinity Church, which is where we're standing now and where we will be holding the service. For many years, Christians from all sorts of churches and congregations around Guildford have come together on this day to renew themselves, to deepen their discipleship, and to pray together, knowing that throughout the season of Lent is a time to build up our devotion to our Lord in preparation for the great festival that happens on Easter Day. And what we do together is only repeating what the earliest Christians did when they came together to make the most of the days that lead up to Good Friday and Easter, so we can join more fully in service to our Lord and in the life of our Lord, in his death and in his resurrection. So welcome to this moment and the beginning of this season. I'm delighted that Beverly Watson, the vicar of All Saints Onslow Village, is preaching for us tonight. She has recorded the sermon for various uh, reasons. But we also have readers from across the churches and the prayers as well. Jonathan Hedgecock, an associate minister here at Holy Trinity, will be presiding at the service. And I'm delighted that Wayne Hawkins, the United Reformed Church Minister on Portsmouth Road, will be reading the gospel for us. And so we come together as Christians ready to receive from God and to give ourselves afresh in God's service. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please sing at home our hymn, 40 Days and 40 Nights. Sisters in Christ, since early days, Christians have observed with great devotion the time of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and prepared for this by a season of penitence and fasting. 
By carefully keeping these days, Christians take to heart the call to repentance and the assurance of forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel, and so grow in faith and devotion to our Lord. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the Church, to the observance of a holy Lord, by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. Let us pray for the grace to keep Lent faithful. We say together, Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made, and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We hear our Old and New Testament readings. A reading from the book of the prophet Joel. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows? whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, Where is their God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you. And on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But, as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way. Through great endurance, 
in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we sing our second hymn, Lord Jesus, think on me. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. The Lord is a great God. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Pardon not your hearts. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who'd been caught in adultery, and making her stand before all the people, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They said this to test Jesus, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. 
When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and, and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Well, our gospel reading for this evening is one of profound insight, insight into the very nature and character and identity of Jesus. It seems highly appropriate as we prepare to walk with Jesus through these 40 days of Lent, remembering his own 40 days in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. The gospel story begins with Jesus coming down from the Mount of Olives and appearing in the temple courts. The temple is often the site of Jesus' teaching ministry in John's Gospel, and once again, people gather round to hear him speak. But immediately, this peaceful scene is interrupted by a shocking event. The scribes and Pharisees drag in a woman, reputedly caught in the act of adultery, and make her stand before everyone. They say to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? To our eyes, our ears, it's outrageous, almost unbelievable. What sort of way is that to address a matter of justice, we might ask? Since when was it okay to publicly humiliate someone in order to deal with a problem? Have they not heard of the notion of a fair trial? And while we're at it, where is the second person in this case of adultery? Someone can't really commit adultery on their own. And John, in his Gospel, gives us a moment of breathing space before we hear what Jesus' response will be. John tells us that the scribes and Pharisees had brought this woman in and asked this legal question simply to test Jesus, to set a trap for him. From our perspective, that's worse still. This woman is simply a pawn in the political wranglings of those religious leaders, and they really should have known better. So how would Jesus respond? How would he address this disruption to his teaching session in the temple courts? Well, Jesus takes a moment or two to consider. John tells us that Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. What was he doing, I wonder? There doesn't seem to be any record of what he actually wrote. I guess he was taking a moment to think and to pray, to carefully consider how he should re respond to this degrading situation. And it was surely a wise move. Jesus could so easily have hit back, giving a like-for-like like answer. After all, those religious leaders were misquoting the Jewish law. <coughs> it didn't actually say that a woman caught in the act of adultery should be stoned, but rather that in such cases, both parties should, would be under the death penalty. And in fact, the law is worded so that the primary focus is on the male partner. Jesus could have pointed out other irregularities in the scribes and Pharisees' presentation of their legal case. For example, the fact that they were providing no witnesses to sustain the case. <coughs> Maybe Jesus was tempted to hit back in that way, just as he was tempted to retaliate during the devil's goading of him in the wilderness. But he doesn't. 
He takes time to breathe, to consider, to pray. And then he straightens up and comes out with words that have become a cultural adage in our society. Let anyone among you who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, it was a game changer. Twelve small words that cut to the core. John tells us that when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. You can picture the scene. Gradually, the penny drops. It's an epiphany moment. There's no possible counter charge to Jesus' words. The bubble has been burst and shamed and ashamed, the religious leaders walk away. And so we're left simply with Jesus and the woman standing before him. In fact, at this point, Jesus is still bent down, writing on the ground. After he delivered those chilling words to the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus has once more bent down to write in the dust. Once again, he takes time to pause and in doing so, allowed those elders to take time to think too before their shame-faced retreat. When only the woman is left, Jesus straightens up to face her. Interestingly, it's the second time in this passage that John records Jesus straightening up. He'd done so earlier before speaking to the scribes and Pharisees. They had brought the woman in to Jesus as an object to be manipulated for their own ends. But in looking her in the eye, Jesus treats her as an equal, a person in her own right. In fact, Jesus treats both the woman and the scribes and the Pharisees as theological equals, human beings to whom words about sin and accountability can be addressed. Now, what will he say to her? Well, interestingly, Jesus asks her a question. He says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? It's as if he's inviting her to observe the true justice of the situation. Her accusers have laid down their case in recognition of a higher law, a greater authority. And so she replies, No one, sir. There is no one left to accuse her, no one left to condemn her, except possibly Jesus. What will his verdict be? Well, Jesus replies, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and from now on do not sin again. It's a masterful balancing of justice and mercy. Mercy because she was clearly a victim of the scribes and Pharisees' designs. Justice because she was responsible for her own actions. In those words, Jesus offers the woman a new future, one marked by freedom and acquittal. He invites her to embrace a new future in which she can live as a free woman, not a condemned woman. But it's a future that demands the renunciation of past failings. In fact, Jesus too offers the scribes and Pharisees a new future as well. He invites them to imagine a future in which they might find forgiveness of sins and the freedom that that brings. Again, that freedom demands the renunciation of old ways, ways of control, manipulation and self-righteousness. In many ways, it's a fulfilment of the words of the prophet Joel in our Old Testament reading for this evening. Joel wrote, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn, have pity, and leave behind a blessing. A wonderfully hopeful words. 
And I think this story and those words from the prophet Joel are a message for hope, of hope for us too on this Ash Wednesday. We too can turn to the Lord, return to the Lord in repentance and faith. And as we do that, we too will find a new future and a new blessing in our lives. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we come to our own time of turning towards the Lord in penitence and faith, our time of repentance. Let us now call to mind our sin and the infinite mercy of God. God the Father, have, have mercy on us. God the Son, have, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have, have mercy on us. Trinity of love, have, have mercy. mercy on us. Most, Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned in thought, word, word and deed. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Accept, Accept our, our repentance, repentance, Lord, for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts towards our neighbours, and for our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us. Accept, Accept our repentance, Lord. For our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Accept, Accept our, our repentance, repentance, Lord. There is a long tradition in the Christian church of receiving ashes as a sign of our penitence at the start of Lent. And so I invite you now to take some ash, maybe from last year's burnt palm cross, if you have some, or some dust, or some earth, and if that is your tradition, to join me in receiving these ashes at home, making the sign of the cross on the back of your hand or on your forehead, as a sign of renewed commitment at the start of this season of Lent. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. The Lord enrich you with his grace and nourish you with his blessing. The Lord defend you in trouble and keep you from all evil. The Lord accept your prayers and absolve you from your offences for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, give to your church true penitence and mourning for the sins that drive a wedge between who we are and all you would have us become. Empower her to welcome leaders and governments to the cries of the afflicted, the homeless, those who are persecuted for who they are. May your light break forth with joy and gladness for all people. Lord, in your mercy, God of compassion, travel with us through this season of fasting. Refocus our vision on your eternal promises. And as we let go of our clinging to false treasures, so may we find riches beyond measure. Bring rejoicing to those in any kind of sorrow to those suffering in body, mind or spirit, and to those who are nearing death. 
Lord, in your mercy. Eternal Lord, from dust we came, and to dust we shall return. In sure and certain hope of your risen Son, hear us as we commend to you those who have died. Bring us at the last to the glory of your eternal kingdom, where your saints offer you endless praise. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us access to his grace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. We exchange a sign of peace on our screens with one another. And now we sing our next hymn, Just As I Am Without One Thing. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right and good to give you thanks and praise, Almighty God and Everlasting Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son. For in these 40 days, you lead us into the desert of repentance, that through a pilgrimage of prayer and discipline, we may grow in grace and learn to be your people once again. Through fasting, prayer, and acts of service, you bring us back to your generous heart. Through study of your holy word, you open our eyes to your presence in the world and free our hands to welcome others into the radiant splendor of your love. As we prepare to celebrate the Easter feast with joyful hearts and minds, we bless you for your mercy and join with saints and angels forever praising you and singing Holy, 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 Holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So, Lord, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and the cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving God, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we, we proclaim the Lord's death, death until he comes. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his son. Lord, and I am not worthy to receive, receive but only say, say the word, and I, I shall be. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life.
Let us pray. This is love, not that we loved God, but that, that he loved us and sent, sent his Son. He is the sacrifice for our sins, that, that we, we might, might live through him. If we love one another, God, God lives in us. Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross, and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you and those whom you love and pray for, this night and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name, In the name of Christ. Of Christ. Thank you to all who contributed to this service and to everyone who participated in prayer. We begin the Lenten season together, strengthened by one another's example, journeying in hope. I would like to invite you to join in as well. Our common witness on Good Friday in previous years, we've had a walk of witness up the high street, bringing together hundreds of Christians from all sorts of churches. We don't yet know what the regulations will allow, but having spoken to a number of church leaders, it is our firm hope and intention that we will provide something so that we can, at least for a short moment, be together once again on Good Friday, one of the central and crucial days of our faith. So until then, God be with you. Thank you for being with us together tonight.